So we have uh, Scott Leinster here. Um, great to see you here. Great uh, to see you too, Ferg. Um, you're gonna. You brought us some wines to here that we we're gonna. I brought you pay? some great wines. Today. Yes, absolutely. Great I've wines just, today. So. Um, uh, let's just get started. So, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, the first wine we're going to try. Well, you know, uh, the, what I've done here is I brought some wines that fill both ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. We got some really great, uh, wines that are at the, an approachable sort of price point mm -hmm. and then followed up with a wine that has a little bit of a higher price point, a little bit more of a specifically fine wine focused. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, moving into the reds, the exact same idea. Mm -hmm. And so it's an idea of like showcasing wines that are, that people are really, really want, or maybe, maybe not may not know about yet mm -hmm. and then also pairing that up with some crazy stuff that not too many people get an opportunity to taste to be quite frank right right so we're going to try the viognier Is that yeah right? so first of all um viognier really really great floral fresh great summertime wine uh this uh, is one of our wines that is through our consignment warehouse. Actually, all of them currently are through our consignment warehouse. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is a $15 bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. And so when it talks about, when you're talking about different wines that, well, we come into spring, once the snow and all the cold snaps, um, mm -hmm. this is the type of wine that you want poolside. This is the type of wine that you want at the end of your dock. It's also a great food wine because it's fresh and floral and mm -hmm. fragrant. And so somebody who's just getting into wine or doesn't maybe like white wine or wine in general, mm -hmm. this is really a great place to start because it does a few things it's uh this one um not only is the price point accessible mm -hmm. and you can find other producers with viognier this mm -hmm. just so happens to be one of the top rhone valley in france producers of uh this particular grape variety mm -hmm. and um and so i wanted to bring it because viognier is not really it's one of those things where it's not a extremely popular grape especially for the the novice wine drinker mm -hmm. and so by being able to showcase it it kind of <coughs> gives you and your audience an opportunity to try something that they may not have ever tried before so mm -hmm. i guess without further ado if we're going to talk about wine yes you should drink sir. it first <laughs> so cheers and so part of the great thing about this is you know the nose on it is mm. really quite nice it's a really floral you get a lot of peach pit and a lot of mm -hmm. like you know fresh aromas mm -hmm. there's no mistaking this for a viognier and There's not a person in the world that wouldn't like a wine like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, I found th I found this wine uh, when I was working at Barrena. Uh, they actually it, um, it actually sold a lot and just went off like hotcakes, which yeah. was very similar to uh, Pinot Grigio. It was yeah. this was very uh, uh, famous with with the women. Yeah, and you know they like to uh, get into that. And it's, yeah, if and you it, like if you like Pinot Grigio in the in the the cheap and cheerful aspect of wine, you know it doesn't have too much complexity complexity you can drink it with food or or on its own this is a great way to go and and not only and then also it's a wine that you can get at a really approachable price point you don't right. have to break the bank to have a really great bottle of wine right which in a lot of ways is part of the focus of our talk today is yes. by being able to you know showcase the world of wine not only on both ends of the spectrum and, right and so you know the, it's a really a great place to start because as we progress through these wines they're going to get a little bit more full-bodied and then they're just going to be um they're just going to keep getting better and better let's just say that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. um would you be uh would this compare to like a pinot grigio or a, a riesling or would you say Similar. it's in a class in it's, it's in a class of its own like they're the the great part is is that the the freshness and the uh the fruit set on the this wine is uniquely different than Pinot Grigio, different than than certain types of Rieslings. You can find Riesling is a challenging grape because you can get bone dry to sickly sweet, and it's produced in a lot of the best uh, wine growing regions of the world, including right here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, so Viognier is kind of in a class of in and of itself, but native to the Rhone Valley, and uh, and it is you know just a classic white grape from that from that region. And so. Get out there and try it. Yeah, the, you we, we, you wouldn't be able to clone this grape. You know how some uh, oh, some sure. here. Oh, you, you can you, yeah, you can clone anything as far as grapes are concerned. It's right. just you run the risk of trying to find out if it's actually going to be something that works or not. <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is, is that you know when a when a producer actually uh, decides to grow wine and then they plant grapes, you know, there's a there's a few, full five years that they got to wait before they're actually going to get quality grapes out of their out of their vineyard. So you know that's a lot of time to invest. Um, and and some of the some vineyard plots in the world are some of the most expensive plots of land that that's ever that they're ever going to that they could ever pay or find right and so the amount of money that it takes to invest in actually trying something new mm -hmm. is sometimes 
against the principle of what grape growing is. Like, for example, the next bottle of wine that we're going to be tasting is a white Burgundy. Mm -hmm. They've been growing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Burgundy region of France for over 2,000 years. Yes, absolutely. And there's no, they're not going to be changing that methodology <laughs> yeah. because that's where the, some of the best wines in the world come from that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you'd like, we can absolutely. jump right into it. Let's but, jump right um, into it. And so this white, white Burgundy Chardonnay or red Burgundy Pinot Noir is the exact is some of the most coveted wines in the world. The agency that I work for is is Halpern Wine, and we focus on fine wine uh, importation. And we have over a hundred different producers with multiple wines. Louis Jadot, for example, uh, you might notice by looking at the bottle is um, really similar and to every other bottle that they produce. Mm -hmm. They have really great brand recognition in the fact that all of their labels look exactly the same. Yes. And they're one of the top producers in the area. But they, for example, make over 225 different wines, all wow. of which I have access to. We don't bring in 225 wines at any given time, but it just speaks to the region of Burgundy in the fact that a different wine is produced in every specific commune from Chablis in mm -hmm. the north all the way down to Beaujolais in the south. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, it's, and each plot of land offers something uniquely different. We're drinking something that's called Marcinet. And this is actually Marcinet Blanc. So it's actually like a $50 uh, white Burgundy, which in the, in the idea of price point with Burgundy, mm -hmm. there's a lot that you'll find in the LCBO around $30. Right. And then you'll find a little bit in that $50 threshold. And then jumps up to 90 to 150 to the fact that I have a red Burgundy that we sell for thirty five hundred dollars mm -hmm. for a bottle that was just from the current vintage, so right. it's like the collector market raves over Burgundy. Um, staunch Chardonnay drinkers always classify Burgundy as the best in the world, mm -hmm. and um, and from from my standpoint, it's one of my it's my desert island wine. If mm -hmm. you're gonna give me one bottle of wine for the rest of my life, it's gonna be white Burgundy, hands down all day. Oh wow! <laughs> and so I. And so it's when you're talking about the the fine wine market, like the you know Burgundy is a really really great place to start. And anyone who has you know one of those showpiece show off sellers with thousands of bottles in it, they 100% have Burgundy, or they just don't know what they're doing. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so the yeah. um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I mean, Louis Jadot, phenomenal producer. Mm -hmm. um, Marcinet, a really great. Uh, s dipping your toe into the idea of Burgundy mm -hmm. itself. $50 is not a lot of money to spend in Burgundy. And the fact of the matter is, is that we have this in you know, cases of six and it's, you know, it's a really great uh, opportunity to taste something that's leaps and bounds different from the first wine that we tasted. So right. please feel free. Absolutely. Hey, cheers, cheers to you. Cheers again. And it does have that straw color. Yeah. So l let me ask you this, Fernando, what's your favorite wine to drink? Um, I know it depends on the. Uh... I think it, uh, like if it's gonna be a, a nice summer uh, summer day, so to speak, and I'm up north. I'd like to. Uh, I don't mind. I don't mind the actual Gewurztraminer. Yeah. I don't. I don't mind the. You actual like something Riesling. that has yeah. a little bit of sweetness to it. Yeah, sweetness to it. You like a little sugar to help the medicine. Yeah. Right <laughs> okay. But uh, if 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 it's just um, just like regular drinking. Um, uh, I I do like the the Sassoloro or uh, Sassoloro. Um, um, I do like an Amarone, like, uh, okay. uh, and I do like so you like uh, big and bold reds. Yeah, like do like the Shiraz. Um, okay. So, um, but I, I I remember like loving the Sassoloro from Italy. It's, yeah. I think it's I, I think it's one of my favorite wines. I don't know has if it has to do with all those three masks on the on the wine label, but just just <laughs> it's just nice and. Uh, uh, nice well, you know what? The great thing about wine is that it's a very uniquely individual experience. It's mm. meant to be shared. Um, right. Like, you know, when you open up a really nice bottle of wine, you want it to enjoy it with those that, that you love. And, right. like, you know, that's part of the reason why I love wine. I mean, like, you know, not only is it – it's romantic. You know, yeah. it, it, there's a lot that goes into making a bottle of wine that costs $20. And there's a lot, probably even more, I'd say, that goes into a wine that costs $100, like the like the Spirino. And so the, the idea is, is that it can be uniquely whatever you want it to be mm -hmm. now i mean f to be quite honest i mean like you know i started in my in my journey with wine and falling in love with wine with just like you amarone mm -hmm. i had no idea wine could taste like that as the years go on and we're <laughs> I'd, I'd rather not date myself <laughs> but the um, but as the years go on like you know your taste change mm -hmm. and what you get what you find more pleasurable is like you know i started amarone the biggest 17 percent alcohol wine that the that you could possibly get. North America, we're the only culture that drinks white, uh, Amarone with food. It's a dessert wine. And 
mm-hmm. Italy and around the world. And but our palates are just accustomed to big, bold flavors, mm-hmm. high alcohol uh, uh, across the board, especially when it comes to reds. Mm-hmm. And so, as time has gone on, my taste buds or my pleasure with wine and what I get the most out of. Um, has really changed drastically. Mm-hmm. Now it's the more delicate, it's the burgundies of the world, it's the structure of the wine and what you get out of it rather than just a big slap in the face as far as flavors. Yeah, so. yeah. So uh, when I when I worked at uh, Al Frisco's back in the, well, back in the day, I would have to say, so um, I, I started studying the wines, you know what I mean? Like I would started, uh, and I was studying the way waiters and the servers like were, were actually selling the wine. And yeah. I would see um, the likes of St. Supery, Rutherford Hill, like Cuvesson, Cabernet, you know what I mean? Um, cake bread sellers. And I was like, yeah. what, what is this? What's going on here? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. for me, is I noticed the exact same thing. You know, the way that I kind of fell into, I'm, I'm at university educated, but I wanted nothing to do with wine at that point. I went to school for criminology and psychology. But it wasn't until I became, I started working in the restaurant industry um, to <laughs> pay off student loans <laughs> yeah. um, that, like, I found, I saw the unique opportunity that the more that I learned, and this, and this is sales 101, the more you know about your product, the better you have a chance at selling it. Absolutely. And so I recognized that the more I could learn about wine, the bigger my guest check average would get, mm-hmm. the bigger my tips would get, the more money I'd walk home mm-hmm. with. So it was purely to for for a money making strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what happened was is that I had a a, a really great mentor of mine in my life uh, who was the general manager at the restaurant at the time. Uh, he noticed my passion and the fact that I was rolling with this whole sales methodology. Mm-hmm. And he pulled me in the office and he had three wines lined up blind, like blind tasting, like it just. Scott, taste this, and then I did, and then taste, and then forget everything, and now taste this, mm-hmm. and it was a, a slightly higher quality wine, and mm-hmm. then I could, then he would talk about the differences between the two, and then he was like, now forget everything, and taste this, and it was an Amarone, and I, it was the first time in my entire life I had ever tasted it, and when you, when you understand what it takes to create a bottle of Amarone, it's hard not to lose your mind because of the care in the vineyard, because of the, the steps that go into actually creating this, this type of wine. Mm-hmm. And, and it blew my mind. I had, I, I, it, it was the first time that I just fell on and on down the rabbit hole of wine and never stopped. And so as, that, as time progressed and then I was working at, uh, at a certain restaurant, which moved into a next restaurant, and then I, got, I ended up getting a job at... Harper 60, one of the top restaurants in the entire country, and became eventually became the sommelier and manager at that restaurant and was there for over six years. And in that restaurant specifically, you know, we had $2.5 million worth of inventory of wine, 1,100 wines on our wine list that ranged from price from $50 a bottle all the way up to $10,000 a bottle. Mm-hmm. And so by being able to actually, like, you know, communicate and talk with each guest and by being able to steer them in a direction that's going to give them uh, the best experience is mm-hmm. exactly the job of being a psalm. And it's exactly the job that every person who's experienced in the restaurant industry is capable of doing. Mm-hmm. And because at, at a restaurant at that sort of level, a lot of people will just say, you know what, I just want a California Cabernet for $200. Go nuts. Yeah. And I would do that. But if a person really want to get into the nuances of wine or actually take my opinion as a as like you know, a great reference of standing mm-hmm. right there at the table, looking all dapper in my suit, mm-hmm. um, by being able to like you know talk about the world of wine, giving them something that like a Viognier, for example, that right. they've never heard of before, is exactly the role of that. And by p- allowing people to have an educated guess, because now they're educated about it. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it can be difficult in the old world worth of wine when you're talking about Bordeaux or when you're talking about anything, for example, it can be confusing and daunting, especially Mm -hmm. for a novice. You know, that's where a sommelier comes in about being able to hedge your bets and say that the $100 you're going to spend on a bottle of wine is going to be exactly what you want. Because without it, you're just confused. And there's 1,100 wines, and what do I do? And it's like, you're who wants to step into a restaurant and open up a Bible and try to figure out which page is their favorite? Right. Nobody. And so, unless you're like me, and I actually love that stuff. So, so it's like the, it's that relationship of, of wine to guest to understanding the way that a restaurant works is exactly how I got started and exactly how I just kept stepping up and stepping up and stepping up Mm -hmm. to different rungs of the ladder. And then now working for one of the top importers of fine wine in the country where we have access to some of the best wines that you can't even get your hands on. A lot of our wines that we bring in are sold before they even land in Canada because Mm -hmm. of the, uh, the... the, the frank quality of our producers, like Jadot's of the world, like Jabalais, like Sperino. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot that is to be said about the wine industry. And I can talk for hours, obviously, about it. Uh, was there a go-to at uh, Harbor 60? Was there a go-to wine that you... Like, well, you know, you know what the funny part is, is that especially in our... Co- 
culture and in that restaurant you know that restaurant is you know it's a staple in the city it's one of, it's one of and in my opinion the top steakhouse in all of toronto and not only in the wine program that they put together, but also in the product that they put on the plate. Right. And um, and the vast majority of the people that go there are business professionals. And business professionals have been spending the entire day making business decisions all day long. Yeah. The last thing that they want to do when they come to a restaurant is make another one. And so a lot of the times it was developing that relationship with the guest. But to answer your question, a vast majority of the people out there that want a bottle of wine at dinner want a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, you know, I'll... I can also talk about a lot of reasons why maybe the world of wine is a better option for you. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that California and Napa Valley specifically does a really good job of putting a comparable and specific product within their bottles. Uh, we're paying a lot for them, not only with um, just duties and everything else, and we pay a lot for wine in Ontario. But, um, but the truth of the matter is, is that when you want a bottle of wine, you know what a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon is going to give you. Right. For the most part, producer aside, you know the experience you're going to get. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to spend $200 or $1,000 on a bottle of wine, you want to make sure that the experience you're getting is going to be worth your money because that's a lot of money to pe- spend on anything, yes. especially a bottle of wine Absolutely. that you're going to be sharing with four other people. So that means you're going to be having two. And so, um, so it's about, and so the reason is that people want that is because they know exactly what they're getting. We touched on this earlier about how, you know, French and Italy, they don't make it easy on the guest or old world in general they don't make it easy on the guest and old world let's just say to the to the guests out there that <laughs> um uh you know when you're talking old world you're talking french italy spain and germany um they've been making wine for the as long as wine has been being made and then the new world is basically everything else and um and so th- the reason why they don't make it very easy on our on guests is because you actually need to know what region the wine is coming from to know exactly what grape is going into the bottle mm-hmm. so for example chinon out of france you got to know that it's cabernet franc in there mm-hmm. unless you're me or you do your research you're not going to know that because it's not printed on the label and you don't know what style of wine you're going to get. Mm-hmm. And so a little bit of education, and to be honest, things are moving in that direction. There's a lot of people that are getting into wine. The popularity of the Som- of the Psalm series documentaries on Netflix are, have grown exponentially as far as popularity. The size of... Uh, uh, vintages sections in LCBOs are getting bigger and bigger and Absolutely. bigger because people are recognizing that they can find a lot of value out of wines just even even by having a price point of like $20. You mm-hmm. can go into the vintages section and get a much better bottle of wine sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so cultures are changing. People are getting more educated and people want to get educated because wine is fun. Wine is sacrament. Wine is communal. Wine is something that's meant to be shared. And when you start getting into wines and start realizing what you like and what you don't like, Part of the fun is experiencing what it is that you do, finding those value bottles, and just having fun with it. Is it, is it because the information is available f- for these wines now? People are actually yeah. doing the research. You know yeah, I mean? people Rather are doing... than back in the day where there was nothing really available. Well, yeah, just, I mean, you know, like, just word of mouth, the, right? You know, the, for example, the the there's two there's two types of wine in Ontario. There's wines that you can find in the LCBO, and then the wines that you can't. And all of the wines we're tasting today, you can't find in the LCBO. The submission has been in the LCBO before, and we'll taste it next. And the Marcinet has been there before, but it's not there currently. And so the thing, reason why you, in a lot of restaurants, they st- steer away from wines in the LCBO is because right now you can grab your phone, scan the barcode on the back of the bottle on the LCBO app, and it'll come up with the price, what grapes are in it, the tasting notes. Like, that gives you the, the, the cliff notes of the entire what's what's in the product because without it before it was judging a book by its cover oh that's a very pretty beautiful label label i think i'll drink that tonight yeah and um and so now like you know people are becoming more educated people know exactly what regions of the world that they like whether it be argentinian malbec or whether it be jackson triggs out of niagara mm-hmm. um you know there's there is a wine for every person mm-hmm. and once you figure out what that is people are also creatures of habit so I know if I get a bottle of Submission Cabernet for $19, I know that every time I get that bottle of Submission Cabernet for $19, it's going to be the same. It's going to be excellent, and I'm going to love it. And so a lot of people get into that rabbit hole of, I know what I like. I'm just sticking with that. Just stick with that. And then there's the other side of the coin where, you know, it's about the experience. It's about finding something new. It's about tasting something new. Mm -hmm. It's about the, I mean, I'm a geek, I mean, as far as wine is concerned. So, I mean, tasting something that I've never tasted before is almost more pleasurable than tasting something I've tasted 10,000 times. And so um, that's what's unique about the world of wine is that there is no shortage of information and there is no shortage of no matter how much you study, no matter how down the rabbit hole of like 
being becoming a sommelier or becoming a master of wine or a, a master a master sommelier mm-hmm. um you can't know it all because there, right. there's just too much information out there to know um and it gets it gets tricky <laughs> uh, did, so so on that note did yeah. anybody make you i'm um, sort of like uh, did anybody give you a challenge while you were at harbor 60 or uh, like uh, oh all the time i mean yeah. that's the that's the nature of a restaurant right. i mean like you know the you know the truth of the matter is is that you know uh, we like we touched on before. Like we pay a lot of a lot for wine in Ontario because of the LCBO and because of just the nature of uh, our market. Um, but as everyone knows, in a restaurant, there are markups that happen in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. So the two hundred dollar bottle of Cabernet that I would sell them from Napa Valley, when a person from Napa Valley comes up to Ontario to buy that wine in our restaurant, they'll chew me out because they will buy it at their local gas station for forty bucks or twenty bucks or. Yeah. 17 and and so it's like you know how do you how the the question comes up how do you get away with charging so much for a bottle of wine but there's a there there is an answer to that and there is there are metrics that go into the different markups for every for different restaurants but that's just one example of you know the challenge of it you know at harbor 60 i one of the great things that allows you allows me to make that role as well as it could is to have 1100 wines to choose from so if you can't find a wine that you're going to like on my wine list then you're not finding wine you better have beer Uh, (laughs) so i mean and so that's the you know what i've found is that like you know once people start going to restaurants where a sommelier is a part of the culture in there i would recommend to get engaged with your sommelier Mm -hmm. you use their expertise because it's there for a reason it's not there to just get as much money out of your pocket it's it's not it's about navigating the wine list and giving you something that you may not know existed yeah i mean you know the when a when a guest comes into the restaurant i just like sweet wine it's the worst thing that a song can ever hear because sweet in a from a, a rookie or a novice isn't what sweet wine is in the world of wine so it's about getting all those that information out of a guest and then putting together with them uh, the experience that they're looking for. Yeah. And that's kind of part of the fun. Everybody's got a different perspective. You don't want to seem like you're trying to 100%. rip them off. What I, yeah. you know, if a no. person wants to, wants to drink Amarone like you, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, even though you are. <laughs> 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 so anyway, you know, that's the, you know, that's a part of the fun is that yeah. like you can, you can have, you can have a great experience with wine, but a little bit of information goes a long way. And Absolutely. in a lot of ways, that's why we're here today yes. is to, you know, you know, speak that truth and like to you know showcase you know what it is and you know on that note you want to taste some red yeah okay perfect let's get the white wine glasses out of here i'm gonna pass you those two for yeah. uh, so tell, uh, talk a little bit about this little technology oh, okay. you got here so this is an older model i'll be honest but uh so this is a corvin device so the idea is hypodermic needle goes through the cork into the wine and extracts the wine replaces it with argon gas God that's damn. found right in here. Um, and so the reason why this is, uh, it's a useful tool for me because when you pop a cork on a bottle of wine, you got like three days before that wine is going to be oxidized. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be very good. This extends that life for months on end. Mm-hmm. So in my business where I'm tasting wines all the time with multiple accounts and with multiple people and doing events such as this, um, it's an invaluable resource because of the fact that this bottle of, this $100 bottle of Nebbiolo if I pop that cork, I got three days to sell as much of that wine as I can. But with the Coravin device, I now have months before um, I have to stop tasting this bottle of wine. From a home use, th- the most practical application for this is that if you have, if you like really, really great wine, but you like having a glass of wine here and there, yeah. like maybe once a week or whatever, mm. and you know you're before Coravin, you would either drink a glass of the wine and then by the time you got back to it, it was off and you'd dump it down the drain. Mm -hmm. But now you can pour yourself a glass of wine like we're doing today and then, you know, put it back in the, put it back in the fridge or put it back in your cellar or put it back in your cupboard in the last months and months on end. It's not a forever solution. It's not a forget about the wine for 20 years. No, um, <laughs> there is a relationship to the amount of wine that's extracted to mm-hmm. how long the longevity of yeah. the wine is. But if that if either of those things are true for you, then this is a, an invaluable sort of resource. Can you pass your glass a little Absolutely. Closer? Sorry. Thank you very much. So what part of um, California is this from? So this is actually, uh, so this is the California Cabernet Sauvignon. So the wine or the grapes that are made 
for uh, this this wine's exclusive to us and the wine the grapes are sourced from all over California okay. and so it's not uniquely from a specific place it's made by 689 cellars which is one of our one of our great uh, uh, houses out of that part of the world, and they make some really great cabs, not only from Napa Valley, but from all over California. Um, and they made this wine specifically for us because we were in desperate need of a $20 Cabernet Sauvignon. This okay. one comes under at 19 So this, was actually, this wine was actually released in the LCBO uh, a couple of months ago. And it was written up in the LCBO... Uh, Magazine. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the wine writers uh, talked about it and scored at 96 points. 96. 96 points, which is unheard of for like a $20 cab. We sold prob- probably every bottle that we had in stock, which was thousands of bottles in a weekend. We came back on Monday to voicemails off the hook, emails everywhere. We were shipping wine to every corner of Ontario. It was nuts. And once people actually tasted the wine, it got even more popular to the point where it was in LCBO stores and they would sell out. Like my guy Thomas down here at the Queen's Key uh, LCBO, he was just, it was nuts the amount of wine that they were selling. And so it was fire sale. And the problem is, is and the reason why is because all of those McManus drinkers that are out there, all of those J-Lord drinkers that are out there and two big, huge brands that make thousands of bottles of wine every year, they've been used to the same thing all over and over and over again. And this is so much better. It lights out better. And undercuts them in price and oh so, yeah jaylor is expensive it's expensive now yeah. and so <laughs> now now people are understanding that like you know this is that wine that everybody wants personally it's not my it's not where i tend to go when i'm spending my money on a bottle of wine mm-hmm. but i'm a weird individual um but having said that it's got all big fruit it's got a lot of it's it's got the oak it's got the weight it's got the alcohol it's got a well-balanced overall acidity a well-balanced fruit set Taste it. I mean, you'll know right off the bat. And so it, for the most part, you were talking about what is the wine that everyone goes to in a restaurant. This is the wine that everyone goes to in a restaurant. Mm. And um, yeah, I can sense that. It's one of the, it's, there are more complex wines out there. Don't get me wrong. There are way more expensive wines than this. Don't get me wrong. But what this, this wine would not offend anybody. It's fruit forward. It's big. It's luscious. Yeah. It um, it would go great with steak. It would you could drink it on its own. It's yeah. a versatile wine that the North American market can't get enough of. And so now we have that twenty dollars solution, uh-huh. which was outstanding. I mean, you know, our the business that I'm in is fine wine. So I have no shortage of the best wines in the world that are. Re- honestly quite expensive right um but there is a there's a hat for every head and and you know it by having a 20 dollar cabernet we get to reach so many more people because this is the type of wine that they like Mm -hmm. and this is the type of wine that they're searching for and this is the type of wine that they have been missing and so now we're able to give it to, to give it to them and there's a they now make a chardonnay which is now in market which is fantastic too and so it's quality wine at an approachable price for all of our, all of our guests. So you know. you know what's happening. So what's happening to the ones like you know the yellow tails and uh, you know. Well, you know the the truth of the matter is is that Australia's been making a lot of wine and they had their. I think they had their moment in the sun. You know, like they're <laughs> mind the pun, but the uh, but the yeah. the truth of the matter is is that they made so much wine and they pumped it out to everywhere on earth is that the quality has kind of gone down don't get me wrong there is amazing wines coming out of australia oh yeah don't get me wrong there but i think from um from the value that people were finding out of the bottles of wine it's it's much to that conversation of like education and people's uh, tastes are changing yeah i mean like you know the i'm finding specifically that most of the restaurants that i work with they're not pouring Australian Shiraz as much as they used yeah. to. Um, just like they're not pouring New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc as much as they used yeah. to. Kind of, the bubble is burst, I guess yeah. you could say. Now the, we're at the end of the bubble of rosé. Rosé is crazy right now. Not now because it's minus whatever outside. Yeah. But, um, you know, once the summertime comes, people can't get enough of a of, of a rosé. And, yeah. the, and you'll notice when you walk into NA LCBO, now there's a rosé section where five years Damn. ago nobody would even – Nobody knew what rosé was. They just thought they it thought was, it was sweet p- pink wine. Zinfandel, white exactly. Zinfandel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they all and so, and that's and that's why it never sold. But once you once you start realizing that you can spend twenty dollars on a Provence wine from the southern France, and it's light, pretty, beautiful, and delicate. You know, we represent Whispering Angel, the most popular rosé mm-hmm. in the entire planet. Right. New York State alone in twenty seventeen sold two hundred seventy thousand cases of that wine in New York State. It's crazy what they were doing. And in Ontario, we brought in 
we brought in so much wine and we could not fill the demand. And so I do feel that we're kind of at the upper echelon, like everyone's making a rosé now. So now there's just almost too much rosé in, yeah. in the market. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, there's still really, really great rosé. So mm-hmm. that's just uh, a, an example of how tastes are changing, like, you know, where... Ten years ago, nobody was drinking rosé, especially in Ontario. Nobody, 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 was, nobody. Drinking, nobody was drinking Malbec back. You couldn't even in, find yep, a, a no, decent rosé on a, on a yeah. wine list. No one was now, drinking Pinot Grigio ten years ago. Well, yeah, yeah I mean. they always were. <laughs> 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 uh, but the um, but but therein lies the rub: is that like you know, uh, while while taste may change, you know, what people enjoy is uniquely their own. And so, who am I to say that they shouldn't have a bottle of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? Mm-hmm. I'll have a bottle of Sancerre every day of the week over it, oh. but. You know what? That's not for that's for me. It's not for you. And yeah. so and so it's just a matter of like recognizing what's out there and then just being experimental with it, you know, mm-hmm. finding those different areas of the world and that's where your local sommelier can really <laughs> can really help you out. So Jeff, can you pull up that uh that I think it's the Guardian article on, on the, with the uh, fire in the background in California with the, the vineyards. Um we'll give it a couple of minutes though. Yeah. But uh, oh, there it is right there. There you go. Um so so in a, in a in a situation like that, what like what happens to uh, somebody like submission with California wines or California uh, vineyards and yeah. anybody from Napa with these fires going on? And yeah. do you guys get press releases? Oh, one hundred percent. We have a lot of we have a lot of uh, producers out of California, and it's devastating, especially not loss of life and everything. Like you know, at the end of the day. Um, it's it's a terrible situation. Um, you know, just to speak about the wine side of it all, um, you know, the grapevines are incredibly hard to burn. Um, they're alive. They're like, you know, it's it, you, you can stick them in a fire and they're not going to catch on fire mm-hmm. until... Well, until that happens, then yeah, they're yeah, catching yeah. on fire. Yeah. But the uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that it's a really where it becomes most devastating is when we touched on this, uh, I think earlier when we were talking, you know, when a when a when a wine grape grower has a brand new plot of land and they're going to plant wine like right away and to produce it for the world and for the masses, it takes a good five years before you're getting quality wine out of those vines because the roots need to grow down. They need to get established. And then it's not until then that you're able to produce a wine that's worth selling, I guess you could say. So the most devastating part is, is the smaller producers that lost everything. Like, Uh. you know, you're talking about six years later, like they got to, they got to handle the fact of all the the loss of everything Uh. and not have an income for Like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, wine and growing wine is agriculture. Right. You, you could be, you could have an apple orchard, and the exact same, the exact same principles apply. You know, you don't want that to happen to anybody. And you know, the we have um, one of our biggest suppliers in California is called Cliff Levy, and they make a uh, their their top wine is the poetry. If I had this picture, I wish you had it because it's <laughs> it's it's stunning. But like, so their poetry comes from one specific vineyard plot that, it, it, and every year they produce like one of the most coveted wines in our portfolio every year, year in year out people can't get enough of it well they showed us a picture of the last year's uh, fires in california Mm -hmm. and there's a big hillside that's right behind it which helps protect the vines which a lot of things in wine like the at where the plot of land is dictates how good the wine is going to be right that's why a lot of the most expensive wines in the world cost that much because those plots are coveted and so this picture is much like this it's the, it's just scorched earth in the background. It's right. just all black. Everything's just wiped out. But then the poetry vineyard right there in the middle, green, lush, still sitting there. Oh, still oh wow. So that's a good example of like a, a warm-hearted story about the mm-hmm. fact that like not everything was – it. a lot of the loss came – more for the chateaus and the houses and where people lived. Um, and don't get me wrong, there was, a, like, O'Shaughnessy was a, it's not a wine that I represent, but it was a wine that I sold a bunch of before. But their vineyard plot was just wiped out. Wow. Just in the path of it all. You know, O'Shaughnessy, they're going to be fine. They're a huge company that, um, that you know, insurance and all this stuff, you know, they're, they'll steady the course. It's the smaller producers, like the producers that make wine of submission, where this is actually wine that's sourced from all over California, from big and small producers alike. Mm-hmm. It's those smaller producers that, you know, lost everything that you, your heart really goes out. So what is considered a smaller producer? Like, you're going by bottles, obviously, or like, well, are you pr- going but I'm going, going about, like, you know, uh, I mean, geez. Well, I mean, take Burgundy, for example. Burgundy uh, is a long story, but there are some producers that have one strip of land. 
or one one row of vines and that's mm-hmm. the those are the wines that the, those are the grapes that they produce year in and year out mm-hmm. and they sell them to people and they make a wine yeah the smaller producers might have a couple hectares of uh, of land under vine and they'll farm that each and every year um, each producer is different some mm-hmm. uh, are you know producers that have had lands uh, land for eons and mm-hmm. some are just big conglomerates that just buy it all up which is right. more the case yeah um, but uh, but it's it's one of those things where like you know you to make to make to be very successful in growing wine, you have to have a passion for it, and you really have to, um, really have to love it because it's painstaking work, and there's a lot that yeah. goes into it. You know, th- picture this. I mean, picture you have the best conditions, you've had the best, su- the best summer, the best grape growing of of all, and then right when you're ready to pick uh, and and pick all of the, it's like a whether you use machine or whether you hand harvest yeah. it. If it starts raining in the middle of that. You could lose everything because now all of your grapes are soaked in water, and so it dilutes them, and then the quality goes way down. So an entire season of growing could come down to two days of hail, devastating for a oh. vineyard. Um, uh, frost, devastating for a vineyard. Um, like So all of these things kind of factor in, and so you really have to have uh, you know, the knowledge to know when to pick, when not to, when to... Uh, use all of the techniques that wine growers do and that every a- person in agriculture has to do mm-hmm. in order to make the best product due to the conditions that are around them. Like climate, for example. You know, climate is something that's com- that's changing all in all. Look at what's happening in California. Right. And so it's like you, by, you really need to understand what the climate around you is in order to produce the best wine you can. And the good news is, is that fine wine producers are the best producers in the world. Get it. And yeah. they won't get it every single year because trial and error, even mm-hmm. the best screw up sometimes. Even mm-hmm. Michael Jordan misses a, misses a <laughs> yeah, shot. Yes. But uh, but the but the truth of the matter is is that like you just have to have if they have that passion, then they're gonna make they're the, gonna make it. The yeah. wine's gonna come. Yeah, they're through. gonna survive. Like the last wine. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pull up that Lund University climate change uh, affecting wine? I think she's got glass. She's not. She's got glare. There. Climate change yeah. affects wine growing in a lot of ways. So grapes are extremely climate sensitive, and this is part of what makes them so special. That you can taste the flavors of a unique place based on where it's grown and how it's grown, and a lot of that signature comes from the climate. So with the changing climate, we're actually changing the flavors of wines, and that happens through a variety of ways. There are basic taste compounds, acids and sugars, that are affected by climate, and. Basically, in a warmer climate, you have too much sugar, which ferments into too much alcohol, and not enough acid, which makes it less complementary to food. Um, You also have potentially less flavor compounds, and those are flavor and aroma compounds that we're just really starting to understand. There's over a thousand of them that have been identified in wines. Um, People have different sensitivities to them. Sometimes they interact to produce a flavor or a smell. Sometimes there's just one compound. But in general, we know that they're very sensitive to climate. They're often accumulating towards the end of ripening. So changes in climate or warmer climate during that time could limit the flavor compounds in in wines. So traditionally, wine is grown in these Mediterranean regions around the world. And they have their unique characters and flavors, their unique devotees, people who like a particular wine from a particular place because it speaks to them about that place. It has the terroir, the flavor of that place. One trend we've seen very clearly is that many wines around the world are becoming higher alcohol. So some of that has been linked to climate change. Some of it is also from preferences from winemakers and stylistic differences. But in places like Australia, it's been linked clearly to climate change. So warmer climates produce higher alcohol wines. Uh, They also produce lower acid wines. The flavors are are more complex and subtle, but those are things we're starting to see change as well. It's easy to say, oh, we can just shift and we can move to new places. And yes, there are places that might stand to benefit from new climates, but there's a really important cultural aspect to wine and to other crops where it takes generations to figure out how to really grow wine well on your land. And that's something that growers have told me and that they take pride in, that they learn from their forefathers, from their parents and grandparents, where to grow and how to grow wine. So I think this cultural aspect is something that is learning that happens over time and it's not easy to pick up and move between places. And that's a big part of what makes wine so special and makes wine from a certain place taste the way that it does, is how it was grown and by whom and in what way it was grown. And that's knowledge that we're in danger of losing from climate change, that it's very difficult to keep up with the pace of climate change. Wine is a way to illustrate that Uh, we really depend on nature for everything we need to live, (laughs) but also a lot yeah, um, there's a lot to unpack there. I'll be yeah, honest. Yeah. Um, she's absolutely right. Um, you know, climate change affects everything 
that's under climate. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the truth of the matter is, is that, and I was speaking with this actually with uh, the export director, Siegfried Pick from uh, Louis Jadot just uh, the other week when we had dinner. Um, and I brought this up because it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the thought that where someone has been growing one type of grape forever now as the climate gets hotter and hotter and hotter, um, is that still necessarily the right place to grow the same grape? And the truth of the matter is, is that yes, it is. Because it's linked to the soil, it's linked to the land, it's linked to the overall climate of where it's been established. Mm -hmm. And every winemaker, no matter where they live, deals with fluctuations in their climate based off of vintage to vintage to vintage. Mm -hmm. You could go from having like a cooler vintage to a warmer vintage back to a cooler vintage. And uh -huh. the fluctuation is one or two degrees in either direction uh, year after year. That's what winemakers have to do all the time. It will change the structure of the wine based off of the changing of the climate. Uh -huh. But when you're dealing with the fact that you have to make the best wine possible based out of the conditions that you're you given, have, yeah. then that's exactly what being in agriculture exactly is. I mean, like, you know, there, there are changing theories. Like, you know, for example, champagne. So champagne has to be grown in, in the Champagne region of France. That's the regionality. There's a dicta it's dictated that you can't call something Champagne unless it comes from Champagne. And that's always going to be the case. Uh, but what they're also noticing is, is that the reason why Champagne is so good and why it's so coveted and why it's grown there is because they have a very high chalky soil composition from mm. the Champagne region of France. But you know who else has that? Just on the other side of the river in southern United Kingdom. So now a lot of the Champagne houses are actually making making wine out of the southern uh, United Kingdom because oh, wow. they have very similar uh, soil types. Mm -hmm. They'll never be able to call it champagne, but what they are, they call it fizz. Can you believe it? They call it fizz. <laughs> champagne fizz. They call it just, just fizz. fizz. I mean, fizz. why the British do it like that? Uh, I mean, I maybe know. they should exit. But anyways, the, um, <laughs> the, so the, the point I'm trying to make is that you can grow and make, uh, now that it's opening up the world to different uh to different areas where you can grow wine and grow quality wine. Look at here in, in Ontario. Our our wine industry is quite young, but it keeps getting better and better and better over time. Mm -hmm. And that might, that might be because of climate change. Things should get warmer and just like the lady said, I don't remember her name, sorry. But, um, you know, as it gets warmer, we can get more, it gets hotter, we can extract more alcohol, and we can grow different grape varieties. 100% mm -hmm. true. But in Burgundy, for example, where there is no more land, you can't buy Burgundy land unless someone's selling it. Right. You can't just invent or just plant, plant grapes willy-nilly. Yeah, they're, not, to get they're not going anywhere. They're not going they're anywhere. Right but they are going somewhere in the fact that now a lot of the Burgundy houses are actually buying up uh, property in the Oregon and Willamette Valley because – their climate and their soil types and their aspect of like side of the hill and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. is quite similar to where the best wines from Burgundy actually come from. Mm -hmm. So Louis Jadot has a property called Resonance out there. Um, you will find that uh, a lot of the houses are actually buying up land because now they're producing a wine out of Oregon where much like us, their wine industry is quite young. They haven't been yeah. making quality wine for quite that uh, quite a lot of time. So there is something to be said about that, but it's honestly a challenge that winemakers face year after year anyways. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our climate seems to be going in one direction. And so only, I hope, I just hope that, you know, the climate changes as opposed to the uh, the wines themselves. Uh, so uh, does the ice wine that's produced here in Niagara, is that changing at all because of climate change or is, is it still? Uh, no, because it, we are no? a cool climate region. We can yeah, make ice we're wine. Good. We're good. Um, you know, Germany is where it started and that's where some of the best ones are, but we make some incredible wines here in Niagara. And ice wine is linked to, the way you make ice wine, uh, you know, just to, you leave the grapes on the vine until there's snow on the ground and then they freeze and then you pick them in like February. Yeah. Um, um, and you have to pick them at night and you have to pick them when it's at least minus eight and you have to uh, crush them like, you know, within a certain amount of time because the grapes are frozen. You can extract the water weight in a grape and then keep the sugars, which is why it's so sickly sweet. Right. So that's how you produce ice wine. So unless we don't have a winter, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which doesn't look likely, uh, we're going to make ice wine. Yeah. And, um, and so it's just, you know, uh, the, the ways that you can manipulate a grape, the ways in which you can organize your vineyard, the ways in which you can protect it from certain elemental conditions. There are, there are wineries that will actually put a helicopter and, and fly a helicopter over a vineyard to break up frost pockets. Right. Because frost on a grape can ruin everything. Right. And so they know this. There are others that like have like, like big 
not candles because candles seem small, but like a big like fireplace scattered all around their vineyard. And then they light them all just to give that heat, just to bring the overall temperature down. Nice. There's like really creative ways in which wineries, I mean, all of these things are really expensive. So they are some of the things that go into the price of a bottle. Um, but the uh, but there are really interesting, creative ways in which any agriculturalist really has to manipulate these conditions around them in order to produce the best wine possible. And it and that's going to be the case forever. And so the wine industry is really interesting because over 2,000 years of grape growing, you learn more every single year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wines that we produce tomorrow are hopefully going to be better than today, but that's completely dependent on the person growing it. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's what's kind of exciting about it because, you know, for fine wine like the 2013 Lasona that we were, that we just tasted while that uh, awesome video was going on, let me tell you, the wine was fantastic. Um, and But high-quality producers kind of like that will always – year after year put everything that they have into that bottle of wine and the 2013 is going to be different than the 2014 and it's going to be different from the 12 and the 85 that they produced right back when and the way that it changes over time and the way that they put out a bottle of wine you're not going to make the best wine in the world 10 years out of 10 and that's okay but you're still going to make a great wine and mm -hmm. so it's just you know the difference between a great vintage and a bad vintage could be detrimental but it can also provide provide you with a product that you've never had before. Mm -hmm. And so there is something to be said, but there is something to be said about that's something that agriculturalists deal with all the time. So have you uh, have you met anybody, like the owners of these vineyards that you actually oh, yeah. sell? Yeah, yeah we, uh, well, well, we had, uh, we had uh, the export director for Antonori, one of our biggest, uh, mm, uh, yeah. his name is Alessandro Leone, and he is a phenomenal guy, he's a friend of mine. And we get to, you know, it's always great speaking with somebody that's from the vineyard because he grew up, on the Antonori Vineyard. Like, you know, his dad's worked for the company for 20 years. He's been a part of that forever. So he's younger than me, and he knows way more than I'll never know about wine, especially when it's related to Antonori, because this is a, the, the oldest family winemaker in in uh, Tuscany, in Italy, and they make some of the most coveted bottles of wine that are mm -hmm. out there. And so, you know, by being able to speak with him, by being able to taste wine with him, and he gets to talk about the specifics of that wine with the guy that was right there on the vineyard when it was actually produced yeah those are some things that you really you can, i can't get enough of because you know it's actually like it's like talking to, to spielberg about what it is like to make a movie it's like you know it's when you're talking with somebody that has been so invested into it you know it's a wine across the board is a labor of love not only from my perspective but from the people who actually make it and so by hearing that passion come through it really dict it really almost gives credence to the fact that this bottle of wine now tastes two hundred dollars more more than it actually is yeah. because of the story behind it. The best bottles of wine that I've ever had are surrounded by the story around the wine and the company. Mm -hmm. You know, what was that uh, Chris Rock quote? It's like, you know, a, a dinner at a fine wine restaurant with an asshole is, well, it's a, it's a terrible dinner. <laughs> but a hot dog with someone interesting is a phenomenal experience. So it's really, that's wine in a nutshell, is right. the fact that what you, uh, by being able to share the world of wine with people like yourself, a friend of mine that for how long now? Let's not tell people. It's been a long time. Yeah. But like by being able to like, you know, share a bottle of wine like this with, with a with a guy like you is exactly what I want to be doing. It's exactly what why wine is so coveted. Here's a story for you. Mm -hmm. Is uh, one of the wines that we uh, produce is, and this is one of the one of my highlights from 2018. So one of the new wineries that we produce is uh, D Wade Cellars with Dwayne Wade's wine. Mm -hmm. So this is Dwayne Wade's last year in the MBA, and so part of his um, part of his overall goal for the future is like different businesses to kind of like carry him through and after basketball what do you right. do yeah. and um and he's got a very big brand in asia so he he partnered with paul meyer vineyards to produce a wine under his brand to sell in the asian market alone but it ended up being really good yeah, and yeah. so now we represent his wine so he makes yeah. three wines uh he makes a rose he makes like a california blend dominated by malbec uh -huh. and he makes a napa valley cab which is outstanding and um outstanding. so dwayne wine dwayne wade was in market in earlier this year and so i got to spend the day with dwayne wade taking him around and taking him to a restaurant to talk to licensee accounts and going through the nuances of his different wines and then we got to do the exact same thing at night with some of our private account for, with some of our private clients mm -hmm. but what ended up happening is that it ended up being like, you know, this big passion project for him is that like, you know, it took off. It, it was such a such a cathartic experience of like getting Dwayne Wade likes wine, but he's by no means a wine expert. Yeah. But 
tastes have changed in the NBA. When he, he told me directly, he was like, you know, when I started in the NBA, it was tequila. It was like, you know, that was the thing. It was like, go to the club, bottle of tequila. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Well, with social responsibility comes uh, and, and maturity. Yeah. Wine is that. Wine is socially responsible. It is mature. It is, you know, a finesse product as opposed to just like, you know, a, you know, like just a hit, hit up the club and with a bottle of tequila, whatever. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> for, oddly enough, one of the <laughs> one of the NBA players that actually started that was Carmelo Anthony. Mm-hmm. He's been a big wine guy. Apparently, I've never met the guy, but apparently, he was the guy that got LeBron and Dwayne Wade and all these guys into wine and started like really promoting it and mm-hmm. so now there's been this culture shift that like now everyone's got their phone everyone's got like you know social media and everyone's got you know if you're a big name person and you're in the club downing a bottle of tequila you might pay for that um but sharing a bottle of wine with friends at dinner it's socially responsible and it's like it just speaks to the fact that you know having a glass of wine at the end of the day is always a good idea now let's talk about um craft cocktails and how that's been such a big sure. thing craft beer um yeah the past, I guess, decade, it's, seven years. Um, sure, but I mean, like cocktails. Very cocktails have always been, you know, like you know, a big part of uh, of like you know the experience of going out and stuff like that. Yeah. Craft everything has been very, you know, very unique in the past ten years as far as like craft beer market in Ontario. Yeah. Unbelievable the growth and across and across North America for that matter. Um, you know, people can't get seem to get enough of it. And craft cocktails the exact same way. I think. It really speaks to the artisanal approach to everything. Like, if you want to set yourself and be a part, anybody can make a Moscow Mule. Anybody can make a vodka soda. But not everyone can make a bourbon barrel-aged Manhattan with home whatever, whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you can be as creative as you possibly can be. And and that speaks to the level of care and the level of commitment to it. We talk, we've talk we talked about passion a lot today, especially yeah. when, you know, it's the difference between making a wine for the masses or making a wine for the people who want the best wine in the world. It's that attention to detail. Mm-hmm. And that carries itself through in every part of life. But mm-hmm. it also carries itself through in a restaurant setting of having an actual beautiful cocktail that might take a little bit longer to make but it's unique to the person making it it's the it's the care that went into the ingredients it's the you know the the top chefs of the world are always going to work with the best ingredients to put the best thing on the plate mm-hmm. well the best bartenders do the exact same thing just using different things mm-hmm. um and uh and so the you know you'll find uh cocktail bars opening up all over the place with and putting their unique spin on what from classics to originals to whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. and and there's always going to be a market for and to be honest in restaurants you want to set yourself apart you want to set yourself and make yourself uniquely different or just unique to what it is the concept you're putting on the putting on the table every restaurant is going to be it has to has to be like so that. that's good for the wine industry though 100 percent, right 100 yeah. percent. wine's not going anywhere near their cocktails um yeah. you know it's two sides of a different coin um but you know you, you can build you can build a cocktail using wine you can build a cocktail using sake and like you know and and so there's different ways in which you can um you know promote that social responsibility but with also having a good time and making the best spirit you can possibly put in front of you Mm -hmm. and and you know the i guess anybody who's passionate it will come through in their end product and people will go there and that restaurant will succeed Mm -hmm. so uh talk a little bit about uh, the sommelier uh program um so how does one become a sommelier here in toronto or do you have to go to the states to be a sommelier nope no, you don't have to go anywhere. Like the uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, is that most people will, uh, when they start on the path of being a sommelier, it usually starts in the restaurant. Excuse me. It usually starts in the uh, in the place where you find all the wine. Okay. Like, just to be yeah, completely yeah. honest, um, you know, you don't. I didn't. I didn't spend a minute in a restaurant before I went to university, which is probably why I never went to wine school. Uh, but. Um, but the, but the truth of the matter is is that that's usually where it starts and then um, and then it kind of blossoms from there. There are different programs that are there's a program at George Brown to offer like a you know, wine professional course. Um, there is a, a certain company that I actually started with which um, fell by the wayside just because they didn't have their stuff together. Yeah. But uh, but then I took the WSET program through IWEG uh, uh, I W E G uh, which is based right here on Young Street and uh, right across from uh, the Eaton Center. Uh, they have a great classroom. Uh, bunch of wonderful teachers and that's where I went and did my studies and then got my got my got my pin and did the whole thing and so um 
And that's a program, the WSET program, that's offered worldwide. Like if you live in Niagara, you can do that program. If you live in Kitchener-Waterloo, you can do that program. Okay, it's, yeah. it's it's available almost almost everywhere or within half hour of everywhere. And how long does it usually take to get something like that? Years. years. It takes years. I mean, like there's no there's no end game when it comes to wine. Like, you know, it's about where you where you stop. Um, you know, it's <laughs> the, the amount of information is daunting. The, um, you know, to become a master sommelier, there's less than 200 in the world and it's been offered for... 60 years so it's like you know the failure rate of that test alone is 99 percent i implore anybody to watch the the different psalm documentaries that are on netflix right now uh the one and two which are and then the third one is i don't know it's out there you can get it but it really showcases you know what it takes and the amount of knowledge that it takes to really be a wine professional and you know it becomes more and more and more as time goes on but all of it is really really important like you know I can barely speak English, but yet I needed to learn a little bit of German in order to understand what's on a German wine label. Mm-hmm. I have never took geography, but you need to know geography in order to know wine. Um, and you, I've never been an, uh, a geologist, but I need to know soil types and, mm-hmm. and regions. And like there's, there's an incredible amount of information that goes into drinking a glass of wine, um, if you want it to be that. And so there, there are, it's, it's intimidating. But it's not intimidating if it's a passion of yours, if it's something that you want to follow. Mm-hmm. So, and, and to be honest, I, I, would, I would implore every person out there, no matter, no matter how, how much you want to get into wine or even if you, don't, if you have no interest in getting into wine, take level one W set course because it will open your world to what wine can be. It will do something like this of tasting grapes you've never tasted before from regions you've never heard of mm-hmm. before. And a little bit of information goes a long way in the Absolutely. wine world. And people are recognizing this. And at the same token, you get to learn all this information and you get to drink wine at the same time. And, like, it's a tasting course. Let's yeah. get that correct. It's not right. a drinking <laughs> course. But, the, uh, but it allows you to open up your, open up your world that, so that now when you walk into the LCBO, you know, it's a fun experience because you get to, you have a little bit of knowledge to help carry you through trying to find what it is you need. Mm. And are they still doing scotch at the same time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, so you, there's, yeah there's unique programs for beer. There's unique programs for champagne alone. There's uh, spirits, uh, all spirits down the road. There, for any, uh, for any co- uh, <laughs> spirit or wine or beer, there is a class dedicated to, I'm sure there's a class out there dedicated to just IPA. Like, it's just, people are, people can get, uh, very, very. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, right. and if you're and if you're passionate about it, someone's out there ready to teach you. And and you know, it's one of those things where you know an idle an idle mind stays blank. You know, yeah. by learning more and more. That's what's great about wine is that there's no limit to information. You know, absolutely. I, I couldn't wait to finish university so I could stop studying, but now yeah. I just find myself studying more. And so, just because you know, you, when you find something you're passionate about, you kind of go for it. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm continuing to go for it. Can I have another glass of that? This, this one? one? Yeah. Or this one? This one, yeah. The submission. Yeah. Okay, yes, of course. Is that okay? <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's what I'm here for, buddy. I'm not here to waste your time. Can you pull up that, uh, how to open up a, a champagne bottle? you got to see this video. It's, it's hilarious. This guy's from France. Isn't everybody at this point? <laughs> and then I'll ask a question after this. So. Thanks, buddy. Oh, you're welcome. Eric Sablebaum, sommelier at Le Diplomat, and today we're going to be talking about champagne. Most importantly, how to correctly and ultimately safely open a bottle. So, there's a technique to this. Don't open that, that one. It's not just about elegance, not just about celebration, but also really about safety. Because basically, this is a loaded gun. We want to make sure that nobody's injured. In fact, over 80 people a year are injured from flying champagne corks. Some seriously. So that's something we want to avoid. Now, every champagne bottle or sparkling wine, this really applies to anything that's carbonated and pressurized, will come with some sort of a little tap. That's good. I personally don't like this because it's very messy and doesn't always oh, get a so clean a open. Right so what I like to use yeah, is the knife blade of my wine. Just make one slice around the base of the neck to the back, one slice around the base of the neck to the front, one slice up the neck, and what you'll get is a nice clean capsule 
and ready for safe opening. Now, this is where it becomes it's very important. Okay. There are six atmospheres of pressure in this bottle. That is enough to send this cork flying like a bullet, and we certainly don't want that. So from this point in, the most important element of keeping this a safe operation is your thumb never leaves the top. A lot of people like to take the cage off. Really, not only is that an unnecessary step, but frankly, it's dangerous. So what we're going to do is we're going to place our thumb right over the top. We're going to find where the cage is twisted. We're going to bend that out, and we're going to untwist it. There's a great debate about how many twists are in a champagne cage Six known as a musillet, if you really wanted to know the name of it. Generally speaking, some say five, some say six. Really, it's five and a half, but who's counting? Liar. So again, six atmospheres of pressure in this bottle. And what we're going to do is safely dispel that pressure out of the bottle without causing an explosive release. So what you should do is hold the bottle at about 45 degrees. And the reason for that is all of that pressure is going to want to release at the highest point of the bottle. If you hold it at 45 degrees, everything from the shoulders down all the champagne is where all of this pressure is going to go. And the only pressure pushing out of the top is just from the top point here and up. So we can keep most of the pressure focused on the top of the bottle, not where the cork is. So once again, once you untwist that cage, your thumb is never going to leave the top. And here's a really important trick. You're not taking the cork out. What you really are doing is twisting the bottle and easing the pressure back to allow the cork to be naturally released. So we're going to wrap around the cage, and the cage will give you a really great grip on the cork. Hold that ball up 45 degrees, and with your other hand, just gently twist. And while you're twisting, you're just easing back on the pressure of the cork, and eventually it will begin to come out. Generally takes a few turns, and you just want to hold back as it continues to go until you get a sound like this. Just a nice, gentle sigh of happiness. Champagne bottles oh or God. sparkling wine bottles really okay, shouldn't I think, pop. I think that's if they pop, it means they're opening. We're gonna get caught by YouTube there. Um, Scott, I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you for a fact that I know so many servers in the industry. Mm -hmm. They have a good party. It's probably seven hundred dollars worth, a thousand dollars worth, or whatever you probably had hired in Harbor Sixty. But mm -hmm. and then there's that server who gets an order of uh, Vufkiko or, or Dom Perignon, they're like, can you open this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, nothing pisses me off more. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. So um, are restaurants, or are we not, are we not trying to teach uh, these servers how to open up a champagne bottle properly? Uh, like, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, we did a lot of joking around during yeah, that segment yeah. because well, let's yeah. face it; it deserved it. <laughs> but the, um, but the, but, but to be honest, there is a, sp a proper way to open up champagne. Um, if you want to become a sommelier, you have to know how to do that. Um, and uh, he's right; he's going through the steps; he gets it. Um, and there is something to be said about that. A is dangerous, and B, there is a way in which you can, you know, screw it up. Because, yeah. like, you know, when you with champagne, if you pour too quickly, you got bubbles all over the oh, table. Yeah. You know, if uh, does like, yeah, exactly. So there is a proper way to do it. I guess you know that's just if you're not going to have a if you're not going to have a small e in a restaurant, then that's up to the management to really teach the staff. I mean, it's an educational piece. I mean, they if you're going to serve, you need to know how to serve. And yeah. so, yes, I guess is the answer. Um, you know, the but the truth of the matter is, is that like you know, as a psalm in a, in a restaurant, you know, that that is my job. That is my job to do it correctly, to mm -hmm. make sure that you know the that I'm that I, I'm tasting the wines, make sure it's not bad, that I'm pouring the wine correctly, because you know, pouring champagne can get tricky sometimes. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. if you. You know, if you have a you know a tight table and you can't get to the back and you got to pour a glass of wine for someone clear across and you have to take a bottle of wine and pour like yeah. this into the top yeah. of a glass. Meanwhile, champagne glass is is about like this big, <laughs> and so like you know it's just like come on kids, like let's do this right. But anyway, so it becomes a little bit tricky and like you yeah. know and so. Um, so there is something to be said about that. Like there, the truth of the matter is, is that when you're when you're in uh, when you take the the SOM program course, courses, you learn about all this. There's a proper way to open up a wine bottle at the, at the table. And everyone thinks they know how to open up a bottle of wine, but frankly, they don't. You'll, you'll fail if you don't do it right at uh, using the SOM program. So mm -hmm. it depends on how far you want to take it. I mean, like, you know, you can you can use the bunny ears all day long if you want at home, but it's not going to fly in a top-notch restaurant. Right. And so if you really want to understand, you know, the proper way that, it, that people have been doing things in the best restaurants in the world for eons, then... You, it's it's uh, it's a learning curve mm -hmm. and um and you know like they're you know all of those those little nuances you know really say something for somebody that is yeah. really 
un- who understands what it takes. Yeah. And, you know. Let's uh, p- let's uh, pop up that uh, t- blog to top restaurants with a fine wine list. Uh, yeah. So you can scroll up just a little bit. Um, of course, Feel Like It was always going to be there. Always. They have the, uh, one of the highest valued wine lists in the so, entire country. Uh, so there must be there must be wines that have been there for like ten years already or twenty. They years. have they, they have wines in their in their cellar that are over a hundred years old. They have both. I think last I last thing I heard, I think they have like somewhere around. And their 40, Bible's about that big. Yeah, they yeah. have like somewhere around like forty five fifty million dollars worth of inventory in wine. Like that's that's a lot of investment. Um, you know the uh, Villegro they they pride themselves on having you know one of the best curated wine lists in the entire country, and they do. Um, I haven't eaten there yet. I'm hoping that my boss will take me one day. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I really should. Um, but the, you know, I've always wanted to see, you know, what it is that they do. I mean, you know, I, you know, taking a look at Opus, you know, they're one of our biggest clients and they do an incredible amount of business. Barbarians as well. I'll be honest, every single restaurant in Toronto, that top restaurant, uh, wine list, they do business with us because in a lot of ways they have to. We have some of the best wines in the world, including Domaine de Romani Conti. We're the only... We're the only importer that is allowed legally to bring that wine into Ontario. And so if you want to have one of those recognizable wine lists uh, like uh, like Jacobs and, and uh, my friends over there, like Tony at Giulietta, like, you know, there are smaller restaurants and bigger restaurants, but all of them uniquely have these people that are professionals in the industry that uh-huh. are custom tailoring a wine list based off of what it is that they're trying to put on the plate. Mm-hmm. Barbarians and Aaron Barbarian, he's a great guy. I've been there a couple times for dinner and, um, and he's got... He's got some. He, they've been open since 1959, mm-hmm. and some of their wines have been in their cellar probably for that long. And so, you know, the that those are just a, a select few of the great restaurants. That, you know, we're don't get it twisted. Toronto is a great restaurant city. We have some phenomenal restaurants oh, yeah, that are out there. And um, and you know, it, if you're going to have a great restaurant, you got to have a great wine list. Simple as that. Is there a restaurant that you are impressed with? Uh, maybe is not as maybe not as intimidating as these ones, but like some some compact restaurant where. You actually well, if you like food, champagne, there's now one uh, brand new restaurant. There's now one place you have to go to, and that's called a Trois or Coffee Oyster Champagne yeah. Coc. It's right. Be- it's right beside uh, uh, the uh, Roy Thompson Hall. They have uh, one of the best champagne lists in the entire city now, and they're brand new. And it, and not to give away the surprise, but it's two restaurants in one, and uh, it is an experience that is not unmatched of what it is that you get. Um, it is, you know, coffee, oyster, champagne right in the front is like right in the middle of like a, that entertainment district with uh-huh. people like are going in there for a cup of coffee on their way to work and they have great champagnes and it's beautifully laid out with all of their champagnes there. But then it's also a 1920s, uh, 1920s inspired French Parisian like speakeasy. Uh, that uh-huh, uh-huh. that is in the back that you go through a false wall that has a 1920s butler there at the front. Like mm-hmm. it's an experience that you've never had before. Uh-huh. And 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 it's so like things like that are like you know they're a new restaurant but they're they've put together an unbelievable champagne uh, uh, program they put together a great wine program and you know it's an experience that you've never seen before once you step into into that place you just immediately get transported to something that has never existed in Toronto so I mean for example that. Uh, if you want one of the most undervalued wine lists in the entire city, the CN Tower. Most people in Toronto have not been to the CN Tower for dinner because it's a touristy thing. And yeah. they just don't think of going there. But their restaurant up in the, up in, uh, up top with my with my buddy yeah. Arash and my guy Vincent that are there buying wine. Like they have unbelievable wines that they haven't marked up in 20 years. So you can get unbelievable crazy bottles of wine um, with age behind it for less than what you could buy a brand new bottle for right now right. so it's just like it's a it's it's a hidden gem that everybody sees every day of their life but would have no idea that you can get great food and great wine up there and mm. so i implore everybody to just go check it out because best view of the city and you're finding value and so finding value in places like that is like you know kind of a unique opportunity and you just have to get out there and explore it and you know there's some great restaurants that are out there like opus for example their wine list is nuts um for a guy like me i just go there and play i can't afford it anything any of it but i <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I yeah. play anyway. Um, uh, and so, you know, those are just a, a small snaps- snapshot of the great restaurant scene that is here in the city. Yeah, so it's CN Tower, folks. you got to check that out. So, Jeff, do you want to pull up that uh, Wine Spectator uh, uh, Top 100 uh, 2018? 
we'll just go over that for a little bit. Um, the uh, the number one is Sasakaya. Yeah. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you are. 2015 Vintage in Tuscany is one of the best I in just, the entire world. Like, I would, that blow me away. That would never, like, that would always be, like, on a, uh, at the restaurant I would work at. Let's say, for example, Reds, which was, like, I don't know, a long time ago. But yeah, they, yeah. they would have that on their their seller yeah. sheet. So and Sasakaya this, yeah, is, like, for example, um, um, Sasakaya, Ornalaya, Solaya. Are Tidinello? Th- Tignan Yellow is uh, yeah. off is like the other wine of the Antonori family. Yeah. yeah, like those wines, those three wines at the top, the the Salayas of the world, rated a hundred points for the first time by Robert Parker in its in its history. One of the best vintages that they've ever had, and so their the 2015 vintage of all of those wines, you can't find it anymore. It's sold out immediately, and we're not going to see it again. And so all of our private clients from Halper and Wine. Um, uh, scooped it up as many bottles as they possibly could, and you know it is. There is a reason why it's number one because it's a that good, and b y- y- it, people are jumping over fences to try to find it. God, that's uh, that's outstanding. Yeah, that's outsta- I believe this is like. Uh, I know it. I'm, I'm. I'll be honest. I'm a little bit disappointed because none of my wines are in this. <laughs> are in this top ten. So I, I, I got to say that they should be. But, uh, but like some notable mentions. I mean, you have you know one of the best, one of the top champagne houses in the entire world, Dom Perignon. But you have some great ones like Paul Roger that we represent that has an unbelievable story. That Aubert Chardonnay, uh, number six, is you know they make some incredible wines, and we've that's imported. A, that's a California. That's California. California yeah. And uh, you know those wines are coveted, and we've and we sell those wines. That's actually part of our portfolio, but we get so little that people don't even know that um you know shutting up to pop it's one of yeah. those it's one of those uh, cult wines that you know come from the rhone valley of france that like if you if you like a big fruit forward old world wine that's that's the be all and end all like mm-hmm. so like you know taking a look at these these are some of you know the the top 10 wines of 2018 should be representative of the entire world and you just want to make sure that that it is in fact that yeah. uh, but the, the the good news is that you don't have to spend 200 and what is Dom Perignon right now 260 or something like that yeah. you don't need to spend 260 no, for a phenomenal need. bottle of champagne no. go to your LCBO pick up a bottle of Paul Roger for $65 yeah. or call me and you'll lose <laughs> your mind it's so good and um, and so and like Sasakaya I mean like that's a $285 yeah. bottle of wine but the truth of the matter is, is 2015 was great for Tusk and so find those wines you will love them and um, and you know wine spectator and Robert Parker and all of these different uh, Venice media and a, a whole bunch of different things that actually come up do a really great job of promoting the the industry of wine and you know it changes year after year and all of these bottles of wine I would love to taste them all I've tasted a lot of them I'll be honest but uh, but the truth of the matter is is that there's some great wines to be had and every year is going to be different and next year's top 10 is going to be different wines than what's on this oh, year's I've, I've, and um, and you know what that's that's what's exciting about it like you know by opening up something that you know uh, the professionals at Wine Spectator are saying this is absolutely amazing I believe them mm-hmm. um, because yeah. they have a lot of great people over there that are uh, uniquely capable of telling us that now, do, do you feel uh, that we're going to be, Toronto will be starting to, you know, like opening up more restaurants with sommeliers and, uh, or are they, or do you feel like. You know what, I think gonna, it's, I think gonna... it's actually different. I think that the restaurants that are, people that are working in restaurants, re, uh, becoming a server in the, in French and Italy or in, in the old world is, you know, it's a career choice. It's a passion. Like, you know, if you have to, you can't spend 10 years in the restaurant industry without it being a passion or you will fizzle and die quickly. Yeah. And so what I think is more going to be happening is that the people within that restaurant are going to educate themselves much like I did. Um, because not only would they be better served to do so, but it also speaks to what it is that they're trying to get out of it. I mean, like, you know, you could get by, a little bit of education will help you do your job better. A little mm-hmm. having restaurants oh, investing in their in their, their staff, staff by yep. opening up a bottle of wine at the end of their shift or the beginning it would would be better um, to talk about a specific wine that now all of their servers are going to go out and try to mad sell it because it's the two hundred eighty five dollar bottle of well let's be honest that Sasakaya is probably like six bills in in a restaurant yeah but um, but to actually yeah. like have a have the opportunity for a for like the staff to actually taste something like that and then go out to the masses and then sell it i mean that's where you're gonna see there there's there's a select few of the wine uh, about of restaurants that uh will actually invest in having a sommelier on the floor all the time mm-hmm. um but there are ways that restaurants can get around that by educating your staff and getting them on board by training their management to also be sommelier so they mm-hmm. can do two jobs at the same time um you know there's a lot of there's a lot of ways and to be honest a, a 
every restaurant is better for having a wine professional in it because mm-hmm. it's uh you know, it's 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 a unique experience, and we've been talking about a lot of things in the restaurants, right. like cocktails and like craft beer, and like if you throw passion behind it, then people are going to want to come back. And you know, the most successful restaurants are filled with, filled with passionate people, and so. Yeah. How does? Uh, can I get one more of this? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you're the best. You're the best. So uh, I love your program, Fern TV. By the way, <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah, you. I, these podcasts have been great, I, especially around Tiff time. Around Tiff time, there's only one person to speak to, and that's Fernando Fernandez. So um, the man is so nice that he knew me twice. <laughs> thank you, thank you. My so, in closing out, almost. Uh, how does one? Uh, for those who wanted to become a wine rep, and and a lot of a lot of people who come from the restaurant industry jump into becoming a wine rep. Yeah. So, uh, can you lay down a, how how does one become one, and then uh, wh- it's a journey. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it was a it was a long time coming. You know, the you know I actively pursued a, a role in my industry of fine wine sales for a couple of years. Excuse me. Um, lunch is catching up with me, but the, um, and so, I mean, the, the, the m- most important part is, is that yes, a lot of people move from restaurants into rep jobs, but the, what one thing that you need to, that the restaurant does a great job at is by training people to be able to speak with every segment of the population quickly and contently. Um, by when you're in the world of being a rep within a wine industry, you really need the unique ability to a speak to the level of the wines and B have the sales acumen to be able to do it effectively. Uh-huh. Because um, and so um, for me, my my journey included a couple of years as uh, with intense sales training at Telus, and so that you know is not wine, but it is you know high pressure sales environment, and mm-hmm. so like that speaks to what it takes to be a wine rep because it is sales, and so you got to be prepared for that. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's a combination of both. I mean, like you know, you can't you can't be a hundred percent into wine sales without loving wine and loving sales. So understand those two aspects of the business. Two different worlds, yeah. Two different worlds yeah. altogether. They're, and neither of <laughs> yeah. the, the, the best part is is that, that what I love about the restaurant industry is that the people that are within it. Because anybody who's never worked in a restaurant has no idea what it takes to work in a restaurant and how to do it effectively. Yeah. And employers, I hope, are and continue to be to are, are recognizing the skill set that working and being in the restaurant industry brings for you. Hard work, determination, being able to wear a smile on your face no matter the most irate of customers and giving them a great experience no matter what the conditions. All of those things are, are applicable to every segment of the population, every segment of business. Mm-hmm. It's just about, to be honest, knowing don't get into wine sales if you don't like wine. Just like don't get into any shoe you know. sales if you don't like shoes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you know if you're passionate about what you do, you never work a day in your life. So just yeah. understand that if you're going to pursue a, uh, something in the wine business, you know, take level one W set, man. Yeah. That's um, I'll say it again. I mean, it's you know it it'll serve you in life. Um, have you ever been to a, a have you ever been to a wine tasting as yeah, a so, novice? Yeah. I, I, like as a novice, if you walk into a place and people are swirling glasses saying this smells like cardamom and, vi- and dried violets oh, and, cr- and yeah. crushed this and cedar cedar plank, whatever. I mean, the those are all terrible descriptors, by the way, just <laughs> FYI. But the um, – and by no means relate to any of the wines we just tasted. But regardless – it can be intimidating because you feel like it's a whole other language. And by taking the course, even level one, it allows you to understand and speak it at least a yeah. little bit. And that will serve you in a lot of different functions, especially when wine is always a part of dinner. It's yeah. a part of food. It's a part of part life. Of culture. Yeah. A part of culture and life. So it's like – so I would I would implore everybody to, to go for it. And then from there, you can decide if it's something you're into. Then take yeah. level two or don't. And it's, it's really um, – it's a skill set that is really, really valuable, and especially in the business community. Yes, it'll help you. Yeah, it'll help you in your life. You heard that. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott. Fernando, for, my pleasure. Thanks for having thanks me. Thanks for uh, bringing in these wines and having me taste them and having me enjoy them. And uh, I can't thank you enough, my friend. Thank my you. My pleasure. So much. Now, me and you can get out of here and drink all of this. <laughs> How about that? Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs>